SN1 versus SN2. Now, in the last couple of lessons, we've dealt with SN2 reactions and SN1 reactions and kind of comprehensively covered both. In this lesson, we're going to compare and contrast those two, and we'll look at differences in substrate, differences in nucleophile, differences in solvent, and then we'll see a similarity in the leaving group trend. And we'll kind of cover a couple other differences as well. And then finally, we'll take, you know, given an alkyl halide and a nucleophile, how do you predict which of these reactions is happening, and then how do you determine the products of that reaction? Now, if this is your first time joining me, my name is Chad, and welcome to Chad's Prep, where my goal is to make science understandable and even enjoyable. Now, this is my new organic chemistry playlist. I'll be releasing these lessons weekly throughout the 2020-21 school year, so if you don't want to miss one, subscribe to the channel, click the bell notifications, you'll be notified every time I post a new lesson. Cool, we've kind of covered SN1 and SN2 at length here. So we're gonna do some comparisons between the two, but there's one other kind of halide we should really talk about. So, and that halide is what I'm gonna call an sp2 halide. So if your halogen's attached to an sp2 hybridized carbon, it turns out you're not doing SN1 or SN2 in that case. So if you've got something like this, or maybe this. So substitution, SN1 and SN2 is not gonna happen. So it turns out whether you have what's called a vinyl halide or whether you have what's called an aryl halide, doesn't matter either way. You've got uh, the bromine attached to an sp2 carbon in both cases. So you can't do SN1 first off. So if the leaving group were to up and leave, the carbocation that would result here would actually be less stable than even a primary carbocation and those don't usually form. So this is really not gonna form a carbocation. So no SN1. Also, so backside attack is uh, blocked or repelled, if you will. So the pi electrons actually block access to the backside and repel away your nucleophiles, whether it be on the benzene or on the alkene. And so you're not gonna do backside attack either. And so as a result, no SN2. And so no SN1, no SN2 for sp2 halides. Again, get rid of these double bonds and we can do the reactions, you know, or at least consider them, but sp2 halides, completely unreactive. All right, let's take some time to do some examples. All right, if we're going to compare SN1 and SN2, we want to look at the different criteria and see how things play out so we can really distinguish very quickly between the two. So, and once again, we've already covered all these. I just want to summarize them in a table here. So if we look at SN2 for your substrate, you're doing backside attack. You want the least hindered backside attack possible. And so methyl is the most reactive, then primary, secondaries are pretty slow, and tertiaries don't react. Whereas for SN1, you want the best carbocations, the most stable carbocation, tertiary carbocation is the most stable, then secondary, and then typically primary and methyl don't react. So we see exactly the opposite kind of uh, relative rates. So versus least substituted versus most substituted for SN2 and SN1. Now, your nucleophile, the nucleophile is involved in your slow step in SN2, and you need a strong nucleophile. The nucleophile is not involved in the slow step or in the rate law, and so we say that a weak nucleophile is okay. It's not that you can't have a strong nucleophile, but most of the time, if you've got a strong nucleophile, you're doing SN2. This is the single biggest determining factor of whether you're doing SN1 or SN2. So, in fact, I think it's the first thing you should evaluate, but most of the time to figure out and be sure of who your nucleophile is, you probably want to identify your substrate, and your substrate's the one with the leaving group. All right, your solvent. We said that most strong nucleophiles have a negative charge, and polar protic solvents would stabilize that negative ion a lot, slowing the reaction down, so we want polar aprotic. Strongly preferred. Whereas for SN1, it's not just strongly preferred, but your solvent has to be polar protic so that it can form those strong ion dipole interactions and sta stabilize those carbocations. Finally, your leaving group. This is the one thing they have in common. In fact, we can just kind of make a big general trend here. OTS is the best, followed by iodide, followed by bromide, followed by chloride. Exactly the same trend for both SN1 and SN2. Uh, finally, rearrangements. And as long as you're forming a carbocation, rearrangements are possible. I shouldn't say yes, maybe I should say possible. So, whereas for SN2, we'll just put no, because they are not possible. There's no carbocation intermediate. In fact, there's usually no intermediate at all, so not possible. And then finally, stereoselectivity. So for SN2 reactions, they undergo inversion. And again, you'll only notice this if it happens at a chiral center. Sometimes this is called Walden inversion, in case you're curious. So, and then finally for SN1, you're attacking an sp2 hybridized trigonal planar flat carbocation and so 
you can attack it from either side. And so if it happens at a chiral center, racemization will take place instead. Cool. So these are your big differences. This is what you want to keep in mind. And again, your nucleophile is going to be the first and most important indicator of what kind of reaction, which one of these two mechanisms you're using. After that, your substrate, and then your solvent will be of lesser importance after that. Let's take a look at some examples. All right, we're going to start here with some very standard examples, and we'll do a couple of very, well, you know, kind of, uh, I don't want to say exceptions, but less common examples here at the end. So for our standard examples, so I want us to identify our substrate, identify our nucleophile, and usually by the time we've done that, we'll kind of know which of the two mechanisms here we're doing for substitution. So in this case, leaving group in the first one, who is that leaving group? You should have said chlorine. So in that case, that makes that first reactant our substrate. Cool, and then we want to identify the nucleophile and identify if it's strong or weak. And in this case, it's sodium hydroxide, and you should recognize that sodium hydroxide, sodium a metal, oxygen a non-metal, that's an ionic bond. And so being that you have ions, you've got plus and minus, and when you've got an anion, that is going to be a strong nucleophile. Cool, and if you had to go so far as to look at your solvent DMF, that's one of your classic foremost common polar aprotic solvents. But again, usually you're gonna identify whether you're doing SN1, SN2 before you've ever looked at your solvent. So in this case, first and most important thing is your nucleophile. Our nucleophile is strong, not weak. We are probably doing SN2. We'll confirm that with our substrate. In this case, our substrate is primary. So in being a primary substrate, we can see that we're definitely doing SN2 because SN1 is not available to us. Great. So we thought we're doing SN2. Now we know we're doing SN2. And the fact that our solvent is polar aprotic is just kind of uh, icing on the cake, if you will. Not something we actually really needed to see to figure this out. And so in this case, we do backside attack. It's occurring at a carbon that is not a chiral center. So I don't have to worry about inversion. Hydroxide is just going to do backside attack and replace that chlorine and put an OH there. If it had occurred at a chiral center, we would have noticed inversion taking place, but no chiral center involved in this example. Cool, there's the first product. So second example, who is the leaving group? And you should have said BR. And so that identifies this as our substrate, which makes the only other thing up here our nucleophile. And in this case, being our nucleophile, there's no negative charge. It's not ionic. Don't look at the OH and think you have a metal hydroxide, an ionic hydroxide. This is just an alcohol. And he is a weak nucleophile. And since it's the only thing written, we kind of imply that he's also our solvent. And this is a solvolysis reaction. So but with that weak nucleophile, we definitely know we're doing SN1 because SN2 reactions have to have a strong nucleophile. Cool. If we look at our substrate as well, we can see that this is a tertiary halide. And that's just kind of icing on the cake here as well. With the tertiary halide, we can do SN1. We didn't even have the possibility of doing SN2. Backside is completely blocked for tertiary halides. Cool. And then finally, with an alcohol being our solvent, it's polar protic as well, which again, just more icing on the cake. We've already identified we're doing SN1. And if you're doing SN1, I highly recommend, rather than just simply replacing this with our nucleophile, you draw out your mechanism just a little bit because carbocations can rearrange. And so in this case, our carbocation in this example is not going to rearrange because it's a tertiary carbocation and the three adjacent carbons are secondary, secondary, and primary. No favorable rearrangements, nothing I have to worry about. So in this case, ethanol is what's doing the substituting. Oxygen is going to come and attack that carbon and attach. But again, with a neutral nucleophile, you got to remember that you'll deprotonate right after. And so in this case, we will end up With this as our product, and with this did not occur at a chiral center, if it did, we'd have to worry about racemization taking place, forming both the R and the S. But in this case, this is not a chiral center. He's not bonded to four different things. These two groups in the ring are identical. All right, moving on to the third example. Uh, in this case, who's your leaving group? First question you should ask, and it's bromine yet again. So that makes this our substrate. And I didn't really care to identify him as the substrate so much as I wanted to know that he's not the nucleophile. So the other guy here must be the nucleophile. And once again, being neutral in charge and just an alcohol, he is 
a weak nucleophile, which means we're probably doing SN1. We'll go back and look at our substrate and see that he's secondary. And if you want to ask a tricky question involving substitution, so we usually will involve secondary substrates because both SN2 and SN1, that's the least reactive in both categories. But it also means that both SN1 and SN2 can react with, uh, can involve secondary halides here. So, uh, and again, that wasn't really going to be our determining factor anyways. It was the fact that we've got a weak nucleophile tells us we're doing SN1. And being that we have a secondary substrate, SN1 is indeed possible. Cool. Also, your alcohol is a polar protic solvent. It's not only the nucleophile, it's the solvent. This is another solvolysis reaction. Again, another you know way you might identify this is SN1. All right. In SN1 reactions, I highly recommend you draw out your carbocation intermediate just to check for those rearrangements yet again. Cool. In this case, we're going to form that secondary carbocation, and neither of the adjacent carbons is going to be a more stable carbocation. Have a secondary on the left, a primary on the right, nobody more stable than the secondary carbocation we already have, so no favorable rearrangements. That's where methanol is going to attack and attach, and then get deprotonated. And so this is what our product's going to look like. And in this case, we do have to look and say, oh, this does occur at a chiral center. So and because it's occurring at a chiral center, we have to remember that SN1 reactions, when you attack a carbocation, you can attack it from either side. And so racemization is going to take place. You're going to get both R and S. Now, there's a couple different ways to represent this. Now, some people will just say, hey, you know what? Don't even show the stereochemistry. Just write plus and minus afterwards. That just tells me I get both the plus enantiomer and the minus enantiomer. So some professors don't like that. They're not as favorable to that. So I highly recommend what's always acceptable is just drawing out both enantiomers. That will, you'll always be safe doing it that way. Okay, moving on. In the next example, who is your leaving group? And hopefully you said chlorine. So and in this case, chlorine is our leaving group. That makes this our substrate. Cool. And your nucleophile, you should realize that sodium is a metal, sulfur is a nonmetal. That's an ionic compound. And having a negative ion, that's a strong nucleophile. In fact, sulfur is pretty much the strongest of the nucleophiles we know. So this is an amazing nucleophile in this case. Uh, and finally, if you cared, you could have identified DMSO as a polar A product solvent and stuff. But once you knew you had a strong nucleophile, you probably knew that you're doing SN2. So we just got to make sure it's possible. Look at your substrate. Your substrate is secondary halide, and that means SN2 is possible. It's going to be maybe slow, but it is possible. And then DMSO is your polar A product solvent, one of the common ones. So everything signals to SN2. But once we identified that we had a strong nucleophile, so greater than 90% chance we're doing SN2 at that point. All right, so we're going to do backside attack. It is occurring at a chiral center this time. And so we do have to remember that inversion is going to take place with SN2. SH is our nucleophile. He's what's going to be replacing that chlorine. But now he'll be a wedge. Cool. And our product is simple as that. All right, finally, one more here, standard example. So one, you should look and see, oh, silver nitrate. Chad said something about silver nitrate. Silver nitrate is there to precipitate out the halide and favor carbocation formation. So facilitate carbocation formation. So probably doing SN1 here. So in this case, chlorine is our leaving group, and that makes this our substrate. So, and again, silver nitrate is not part of the uh, product or anything like that. So it is water of it as our nucleophile and being neutral here, it is a weak nucleophile, which means we're doing SN1. So we got a weak nucleophile. Can we do a weak nucleophile here with a secondary halide? Yeah, we totally can. So weak nucleophile, secondary halide, SN1 is possible. Water also again is our solvent as well and is polar protic. Everything signals SN1. And again, if you're doing SN1, I highly recommend you draw out your carbocation. And in this case, we have a secondary carbocation. So, and if you look at the two adjacent carbons, one's primary, one's secondary, and you say, oh, there's no favorable arrangements, except that there is in this case. We are actually going to do a hydride shift so this is a little trickier than the other examples because it doesn't look like there should be a rearrangement, but there is. We'll do a hydride shift. 
And even though our carbocation did, didn't get more substituted, the real rule is not that your carbocation has to get more substituted, it's that your carbocation has to get more stable. And in this case, he's not just secondary, he's secondary and benzylic, one bond away from a benzene ring, and he's stabilized by resonance. And so he's not more substituted, but he is more stable, and that's really the rule. Cool, and that is where the substitution is gonna take place. Water's gonna come and attack. So, but again, with a neutral nucleophile, you'll deprotonate right afterward if possible, and we'll pull off one of the H's, so an OH is gonna end up there. That is a chiral center. And so racemization is gonna take place. So the OH could be a wedge. Or that OH could be a dash. Cool, so a little trickier example here, and I'm gonna get trickier still on these last two. So I start off with some really standard ones. We got a little bit tricky with a carbocation rearrangement, and again, a couple of little more tricky ones yet. Let's get some room though. All right, these are our last two examples here. Start with this top one, and my first question for you is, who is your leaving group? And hopefully you said iodide here, and uh, in this case, that makes this first reactant our substrate. Cool, which makes this our nucleophile here, and you should realize this is not an ionic compound, it's just an alcohol, and that makes it a weak nucleophile, which probably means, again, we're doing SN1. If we take a look at our substrate, though, we have a problem, is that this is a primary substrate. And we look at SN1, we're like, ah, uh, we can't use primaries. Unless, we said, though, they're stabilized by resonance. And this is not just primary, it's primary and allylic. That is one carbon away from an alkene, and the carbocation we form would be resonance stabilized. And so in this case, we're doing SN1. So weak nucleophiles only have SN1 as an option, and in this case, normally we think primary halides, SN1 would be possible, but in this case it is, because we're gonna form this resonance stabilized cation. And once again, I recommend, if you form a carbocation, you should draw it out. And in this case, we should draw both resonance structures. It's gonna be really important. So in this case, resonance implies that the positive charge here is being shared between two different carbons, not just on a single carbon. And what that means though, is that our weak nucleophile actually can attack in two different locations. And that's gonna be unique to this kind of a situation. So that's, this is doubly tricky. One, it's SN1 with a primary halide because of resonance. So, but also substitution is gonna occur in two different locations because of that resonance stabilized carbocation sharing that positive charge in two locations. So if, if uh, if isopropyl alcohol here attacks on this carbon that shares a positive charge, you get the product that we'd probably expect here. So which is that guy? So just attached isopropyl alcohol to that one and then deprotonate it after the fact. Again, with a neutral nucleophile, you typically deprotonate right after. So but for this other one here, All of a sudden now we form a chiral center in this example. And so you get a pair of enantiomers as well. And so where we substituted in the first example uh, was not a chiral center, no chiral center formation, so we didn't have to worry about racemization. Uh, but in the second example where we substituted here, uh, definitely was a chiral center and led to a racemic pair. Uh, uh, true, again, not truly a racemic mixture, slight excess of the inverted one, or actually in this case, it might be truly racemic because that's not where the leaving group left anyways. I actually don't know how that works. Uh, but definitely not just the product we might expect, but an additional product here with that positive charge shared in two locations. All right, finally, one more example. And my question for you is, who's the leaving group? And hopefully you're saying it is chlorine. Cool, and in this case, you realize that makes this your substrate. Which makes this guy your nucleophile. And you should look at him and be like, oh, there's no negative charge. But then some bells might go off in your head and said, oh, Chad said, if you have phosphorus, sulfur, or nitrogen, even without a negative charge, they can be strong nucleophiles. And so it turns out this guy still is a strong nucleophile, even with all the bulkiness going on, it turns out he's still a strong nucleophile. So phosphorus, even neutral, is fairly polarizable and makes a good nucleophile. And he's what's gonna be doing backside attack. So 
Uh, in this case, being a strong nucleophile, we should be expecting SN2, strong nucleophile. We've got a primary halide, again, confirming that we're doing SN2, and there was no solvent even listed here, and sometimes they do that. So, although a good, uh, in fact, actually I did that for a reason. I don't even want to deal with solvent on this one. All right, so we did some backside attack, and we find out then that this is not happening at a chiral center but we're gonna have phosphorus here. And that phosphorus is still gonna be bonded to three benzene rings. So, and this is where we as organic chemists get lazy. So instead of writing benzene rings, turns out those are called phenyl groups, P-H-E-N-Y-L, not phenol groups, but phenyl groups. And so sometimes we just get lazy. In fact, we're lazy all the time, right? We don't draw carbons. We don't draw hydrogens bonded to carbons. And, and if we can abbreviate benzene rings, we'll do it. So. And you get this, but that's going to leave phosphorus here also with a positive formal charge. And normally with a neutral nucleophile, like in SN1 reactions, you attack and then you deprotonate it. But phosphorus here doesn't even have a hydrogen to deprotonate. And this actually is your product. We're done. So not the most common thing, which is, again, one of the things making this tricky. So one, we had a neutral nucleophile that was strong. That was unusual. And also we had a neutral nucleophile that couldn't be deprotonated. And so you end up with a positive formal charge on your final product. Now, if you found this lesson helpful, consider giving me a like and a share. A couple of the best things you can do to support the channel. And if you've got questions, feel free to leave them in the comment section below. If you're looking for the study guide that went with this lesson, or if you're looking for practice problems, I've got quizzes and chapter tests and practice final exams uh, in my premium course on chadsprep.com.